Uh, thank you very much, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. And again, I have to thank Julio for inviting me to what's been a uh, fantastic meeting and also to take part. No? <clears throat> so I want to talk to you this morning about uh, brain changes in schizophrenia, and that includes some of the neuropathology and some of the more recent gene expression uh, uh, work we've been doing. I just want to remind you that schizophrenia is a brain disease. I think we kind of lost sight of this, especially in the middle of the 20th century, and that uh, schizophrenia or psychosis is a brain disease. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the brain changes at the microscopic level. Then I'm going to introduce you to some of the work we've done on some more rather simple genomics on both the brain and the blood. How we came across a very strange protein called selenium binding protein. I think the theme of ubiquitin and ubiquitin processing will, is emerging uh, throughout this talk. And then in some time, I uh, shall include some work we did on methamphetamine, which was a very popular pastime in San Diego where I spent six years and is associated with psychosis. So I really think there's an urgent need to uh, clarify the pathology underlying schizophrenia and psychosis. And to me, psychosis is a bit like a a cough or shortness of breath, or from the discussion I had this morning with Jin and Michael and Malcolm, maybe it's a, a sore or inflated knee. But uh, it's a symptom, and if you went to your GP complaining of shortness of breath or a uh, cough, they'd find out what the cause is. They'd do various tests and tell you where you've got a chest infection, congestive cardiac failure, or a tumour. We're nowhere near that level of sophistication. We're still trying to sort out what the cough is. And that's a real pity, and it's a, a limitation to our progress. If I was going to speak to you about Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, which Colin is going to afterwards, it'd be a much more elegant talk. I'd be talking about numerous brain collections, collections large enough to have uh, subsamples, subgroups, and a, a really detailed advance in our understanding of the pathology, including the mechanistic role of amyloid deposition, beta and gamma secretase, APP cleavage, hyperphosphorylation of tau, all these mechanisms being identified and leading to novel treatments. We're nowhere near that. So all I can offer you is this. So I think it's fair to say that at the beginning of the 21st century, it was a place with schizophrenia or psychosis to say there are three groups of brain changes that have been identified. There's a classic uh, definition by neurochemical abnormalities affecting the dopamine pathway, uh, glutamate, and GABA. There's also very subtle but robust anatomical changes. And these include subtle losses of GABAergic interneurons. And the most robust changes are the loss of markers of dendrites and synapses. And uh, uh, one mark of dendrites is a protein called MAP2, microtubule associated 2, which has been shown to be significantly affected in uh, the brains in schizophrenia, including in its rates of phosphorylation. And I have up here two uh, microphotographs of non-phosphorylated MAP2 and phosphorylated MAP2. And the ratio of phosphorylated and non-phosphorylated affects the stability of the cytoskeleton. And then last you have this sort of raft of trophic signaling developmental pathways that have also been impl implicated, including neuregulin, uh, RSG4, uh, DLX, and then uh, a pathway we've been interested in, which is the WIND pathway, GSK3 beta. And I'm just going to talk about this as an example. The WIND pathway, I think, is important because it goes from birth to death. It's very important during the development of the brain. It's one of the key switches that determines whether a cell is going to become a neuron or not. And then it remains active in the adult brain in that it controls the stability of the cytoskeleton, the MAP2, the dendrites, and synaptic proteins. Both these markers have been shown to be abnormal in schizophrenia. And then as you age, it becomes important in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. And the uh, kinase, which is right at the center of this pathway, glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, is central to mediating insulin signaling. So sometimes it takes me back to the old insulin coma therapy, because insulin certainly would have activated GSK3 beta. But this is the pathway where you get a wind signal um, interacting with a frizzled uh, receptor. All these funny names come from mutated mice, that uh, if the frizzled was uh, the receptor was knocked out, they looked frizzled, or if the protein below it was knocked out, they looked disheveled. So, and, um, and then in the center of this complex of GSK3 beta, you have a complex of proteins that if this complex falls apart, the proteins are sent for degradation by the ubiquitin proteasome system. So, and I'll come back to the UPS system a bit later on. 
So it's a pathway which is important to development, important to maintaining the uh, active brain, and goes awry in neurodegeneration. We actually showed in the lab a number of years ago that there was a reduction in the expression of uh, GSK3 beta in the brains in schizophrenia. We couldn't find any changes in another protein in the pathway called beta catenin or in disheveled. But ours and other groups have actually shown there are significant abnormalities at lots of different stages in this pathway. There's been uh, reported an overexpression of the, uh, the lig and wnt, uh, no change in its receptor or the downstream of uh, modulatory protein, GSK3 beta is decreased in its staining. Also, other proteins in that complex, beta catenin and APC are decreased, and that there are accompanying alterations in the stability and expression of <coughs> MAP2 as a mark of dendritic stability and the downstream synaptic proteins. So, this may well be uh, one of the uh, pathways which is awry in schizophrenia, and identifying these abnormalities may in the future identify novel targets for uh, therapy. We were trying to work out where to go. Oh, I'll try to do that. And, and other, other groups have actually shown that if you decrease GSK3 beta, you actually get synaptic and dendritic changes. And often there is a decrease in the expression of these, consistent to what we find in schizophrenia. And interesting, some of the stimulants and drugs of abuse, such as amphetamine, LSD, and PCP, also inhibit GSK3 beta activity. Work on enriched environments and rodents has shown that um, this increases the ligand for GSK3 beta, the wnt, and that also GSK3 beta activity increases. So it may well be that dysregulation of this kinase, this pathway, may play a part in the development of psychotic symptoms. We were trying to work out where to go with this data, and we thought we'd, we'd try and exploit the um, the emerging uh, technologies of the genomics, and by that time I was working at UCSD with uh, uh, colleagues Ming Swang and Steve Glatt, and our discussions moved from the central idea of looking at gene expression to seeing if we could compare gene expression in two compartments, so trying to look at both mechanism and potential biomarkers. So we actually put the study together looking at uh, the gene expression from brain tissue from the Harvard Brain Bank, uh, which Francis and Venice uh, made available to us, and this was 19 schizophrenic patients and 27 uh, psych uh, non psychiatric controls, which were fairly well matched in terms of uh, various variables such as gender, age, etc. And with Ming coming from Taiwan, we had a, a sample of Taiwanese blood. So we were a little bit concerned because ethnically they're quite different, but again, they were a fairly matched group. And uh, so we wanted to see what uh, would happen to gene expression in, in the blood and the brain in individuals with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. This is the typical way in which we actually carried out the expression, obtaining the blood or the tissue, extracting the RNA, uh, producing the cDNA, and then we uh, hybridized it to one of the Athermetrix chips, the U133 plus 2, which um, provides um, probes to the entire human genome. Well, out of 39,000 genes, we actually found six genes with the same accession number that were dysregulated in the two compartments. I thought we were going to be overwhelmed with data, and it was quite uh, nice to actually have six uh, probes to go after. And of those six, only one was dysregulated in the same direction. And that was this uh, gene here, selenium binding protein, and it was upregulated in both the brain and the blood. I'd never heard of selenium binding protein, well, I assume it binds selenium, uh, but I'm not quite sure what else it does, but we'll come back to that in a minute. I wanted to make sure that this wasn't just a, you know, a type one error, uh, so we actually validated this finding in the blood using uh, QRT-PCR, which again showed the gene expression was increased, in the brain by using immunocytochemistry. And this was the typical feature in a controlled brain, what you're getting is a little bit, you're getting some uh, staining in the uh, cytoplasm of glia. You can't see the nucleus of that glial cell, but you can with this one, and possibly some faint staining in the neuronal cytoplasm. By contrast, in the schizophrenic brains, there was much more marked deposition, um, again, in glial cell cytoplasm. There's the cytoplasm, there's the nucleus of the glial cell, and the same there. And again, the possibility of some neuronal cytoplasmic staining. I tend to be a bit cynical about these findings. 
especially as psychiatry is littered with these publications of we found this and then somebody else found the opposite. So we decided if we were going to have any kind of belief for, or traction in this idea, we had to repeat it again. So uh, fortunately, uh, there was a researcher from Osaka, Tetsu Kanazawa, who was working in the lab at the time, and we asked him to work on a completely different brain series. So we, this time we got access to the Stanley mm -hmm. tissue uh, array collection of 35 patients with schizophrenia, 35 bipolar, and 35 much non-psychiatric controls. I uh, wanted him to see if he could actually see if there's a difference in the gene expression selenium binding protein in that group. Of interest, 20 of the bipolars had documented psychosis. So we didn't bother with the appy chips at that point. We joined, uh, uh, went straight to real-time PCR. And um, again, what he found was a statistically significant increase in the uh, mRNA levels in the psychotic group by about 12%. If we broke it down by diagnostic group, the increase was 11% in the schizophrenia group, 14% in the psychotic bipolars, and the non-psychotic bipolars were indistinguishable from the controls. So again, this goes to my idea of I prefer to talk about doing psychosis research rather than just schizophrenia research because psychosis, whether it's in schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, seems to blur the boundaries. So we were quite relieved that we were actually able to validate the finding. And then when I moved to Melbourne, Melbourne has a, a wonderful collection of psychiatric brains, and uh, we recently repeated the uh, study again there. And again, we found a significant increase in the gene expression of selenium binding protein in the schizophrenics compared to the control. Um, that's the uh, p-value. So we've got three findings on three different brain series giving us the same results. So I was also looking through the literature, and um, uh, Sophia Barnes' group uh, actually uh, published a paper a few years ago and looking at, again, selenium binding protein in various uh, compartments, and again reported that it was increased in the gene expression in the blood. And um, another group have actually looked at an organic selenium compound, which they found abolished the apomorphine-induced stereotypy in a mouse, which I'm not familiar with this model. They say is a model of psychosis. Um, and I'll take your word on that. But uh, again, I thought it was just intriguing findings. Looking at uh, SNPs, and we heard a lot uh, yesterday about uh, GWAS and what have you, and I can never really understand those studies because it's a cast of thousands. Um, there's been a couple of studies, again, by Kanazawa looking at a Chinese population, showing that uh, with uh, looking at two SNPs in the selenium binding protein, that there was a significant correlation with the presence of schizophrenia. Uh, one of the SNPs was this 2800953. And then in a Japanese population, the same SNP uh, was uh, correlated normally with various clinical subtypes such as hepaphrenic or paranoid type. And then one other final publication by an Israeli group with Bob Bellmaker has shown that there's a decrease in copy number variation in the selenium binding gene in schizophrenia. So what we're trying to do currently is get a handle on exactly what this uh, gene or its protein does, because there's very little in the literature about it, and I'll tell you what there is in a few slides' time. So we've made a plasmid of the um, gene, and we've inserted into a GFP-tagged lentiviral vector, and we've been transfecting human primary neurons and also uh, differentiating SY5 Y cells. And we can so GFP expression, and we're trying to assess if there's any changes when we turn this gene on in terms of synaptic and dendritic markers. So this is a transfected um, neuron. Our big problem, and these have been a really technically challenging experiments, is getting a decent antibody to the selenium binding protein. We're now uh, collaborating with a group of prostate cancer researchers in Boston who have a huge panel of these antibodies, and so we're actually now moving forward. And uh, by interest, um, selenium binding protein protein expression is a, a, a very important prognostic indicator in uh, prostate cancer. And so we want to make sure we've got a good uh, imaging of the selenium binding protein itself. And then this is our uh, marker of, uh, of uh, dendrites, and we will also be marking for synapse as well. So those experiments are currently undergo, underway. The gene for the uh, selenium binding protein is on uh, 1Q21, which I think was mentioned yesterday as uh, either a susceptibility loci or an area where there's copy number variation. As I say, there's very little known about um, the function of this, apart from the fact it obviously binds selenium, but it's not one of the classic selenoproteins. We think it's probably involved in ubiquitin protosome system, 
as it interacts with a member of, uh, of that system, a de-ubiquitin protein enzyme, and it's found in the Golgi. So we think it probably also has a role in monitoring protein folding and misleading misfolded proteins to the UPS. It's also been found in the growing tips of neurites in SY5Y cells. There's been clinical links so with the expression of the protein with carcinomas and in CNS disease. And interestingly, there's been an epidemiological link between the levels of selenium in the soil and schizophrenia. And I've been told that Australia is a selenium deficient country. So this is a uh, analysis from 1994. And uh, on the left here are, in black, are those states which have the worst deficiency of selenium in either the soil or the crops grown in them. And on the right are those states which are reported by Torrey to have the highest rates of schizophrenia. I think with the eye of faith, you could see there is some overlap. Um, there is this state here, California, I'm not quite sure how that fits in, uh, because there's a lot of migration to there anyway, but, uh, but the, it's an intriguing um, association. So I think from hopefully the, the data I've been presenting to you, you believe that in psychosis there are st there is some evidence, accumulating evidence for subtle abnormalities in the brain uh, that affect uh, gabrotic neurons and synapses and dendrites. And some of this may be driven by uh, important um, intracellular pathways such as a WINT or GSK3 beta. And that on top of that, there is um, uh, a number of observations now of increased gene expression for selenium binding protein, which may be linked to uh, monitoring of misfolded proteins and ubiquitination. So to complement these findings, we decided to try and change tack in terms of the way we analyzed our gene expression data. And instead of just searching for particular, or, uh, particular genes, we'd actually look for pathways. So we'd say, well, we're not quite sure or won't really care which genes are involved, but we want to see which are the dysregulated pathways in schizophrenia. And so we had, uh, by this time, a different cohort uh, of blood, which we collected, again, from San Diego. And now uh, with the Taiwanese series, and we had um, uh, a schizophrenic sample and a bipolar sample in both um, uh, sites. And we used uh, IPA to actually identify the uh, dysregulated canonical pathways for both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And what was very interesting is this, in all four groups, the top pathway that was dysregulating was protein ubiquitination. Uh, my statistical colleagues told me the chance of that happening by chance did occur in all four of these was very uh, uh, unlikely, and this was a very significant finding. As you'll see, the genes that populate these pathways are different in the different cohorts, and that I kind of expect because schizophrenia is such a heterogeneous or psychosis such a heterogeneous disorder, but I think it's more identifying the pathways that go wrong. So this brings me on to the the interest that we've been leading the lab to recently, which is protein ubiquitination. So um, obviously the role of uh, the cell is to um, transcribe the uh, DNA into RNA and then translate that into proteins, but the proteins are very complicated and they have to have a proper uh, quaternary structure and be able to function right. And despite the help from proteins in the cells, such as chaperones, many of the proteins that are folded or the polypeptides that are produced are folded incorrectly. So uh, at least a third of them need to be broken down. Otherwise, they will misfunction and cause problems for the cell. And it's a, it's a ubiquitous pathway. It occurs in all cells. And, you know, it's not really important if it doesn't function properly in a cell that's only going to live 100 days, such as in the blood. But when you've got a cell such as your nerve cell, which has to exist from birth to death and last the whole time, proper functioning of this um, is critical. So it's the cell's vacuum cleaner. And if things go wrong in the cell and misfolded proteins accumulate, you end up with what we understand now to be neurodegenerative diseases. So this is the um, systematic uh, view of uh, protein ubiquitination pathway. So here is a misfolded protein. And you get these E1, E2, and E3 ligases that uh, attach ubiquitin and then transfer it onto the protein. The ubiquitin attached to the protein is a signal for it to go to this cylindrical vacuum cleaner where the ubiquitin is stripped off and the protein is broken down into peptides that can be reused again to reform proteins. Works very well and keeps you healthy, but if it doesn't work well, then you start getting problems. And so we know that certain drugs of use, such as methamphetamine, MDMA, 
uh, cause oxidative stress. Um, uh, Michael Burke talked about oxidative stress and schizophrenia yesterday, which can then cause uh, this pathway to uh, misfunction, and then you can start getting laying down of proteins such as alpha synuclein, inclusion bodies, beta amyloid, etc. So, oxidative stress and a whole series of things that can stress the cell out can actually lead to misfunctioning of this ubiquitination pathway. And um, uh, another lead, uh, intriguing lead, is the involvement of this pathway in psychosis is the work most recently by Dennis Velikoulis in Melbourne, who's interested in frontotemporal dementia, uh, which causes the deposition of a protein called TDP3, because the UPS system is not working properly. And he's found TDP43 to be uh, deposited in the brain of people with FTD and psychosis, as well as some people who are having a late onset psychosis. So, not direct, but indirect evidence that uh, there is a uh, possible malfunction of this ubiquitous UPS pathway that may well result in psychosis. We've more recently looked at um, a correlation of various um, ubiquitin-related genes, whether they're to do with activation, conjugation, or degradation, and their correlation with uh, positive symptoms of schizophrenia and negative. And as you can see, some of them are highly correlated uh, with very significant p-values, and this one in particular also correlates uh, with uh, negative symptoms. But there's a high degree of correlation of some of these genes with positive symptoms. Then, last of all, I just wanted to talk about uh, methamphetamine. So I became interested in methamphetamine with working at uh, the University of California, San Diego, because it's very popular, and uh, the clinic I used to run had a substance abuse clinic, and half the people had an alcohol problem, and the other 50% was methamphetamine. People go out to the desert, they cook it up, it's dirt cheap, and so it's a very popular pastime. It also became very comorbid with HIV. People take methamphetamine, they feel very uh, ecstatic, very libidinous, and they engage in lots of risky activity. But if you use too much methamphetamine, it carries with a high rate of psychosis. So we looked at uh, brains of people who died, and the best characterized brains to look at were people who uh, got HIV, because a lot of these people have been enrolled in studies, and they come to study uh, uh, meetings every six months or a year, and we knew the lifetime amount of meth they'd used. And we did a lot of different immunocytochemical studies, and finally found there was a particular uh, neurodegeneration that was associated uh, with methamphetamine in these people with HIV. And intriguingly, it was loss of GABAergic interneurons. And in this particular uh, case, it's highlighted by the presence of a calcium binding protein called calbindin, which is expressed in these GABAergic interneurons. So this was of a control individual. This is the brown staining for calbindin. This is somebody who got HIV encephalitis. And this was an HIV-infected meth user. And we quantified them, and there was a stepwise progression in the deterioration of the number of these, and also because we had prospective clinical data, we were able to correlate the loss of these neurons with worsening our memory scores and what have you. So we know they are associated with cognitive impairment and may well contribute to the fact that a lot of these people became psychotic. To complement that, we also did a gene expression study uh, on the brain tissue from these brains and found by our amazement that um, the genes that were massively upregulated were interferon-related genes, such as ISG15. And uh, this was certainly a uh, quantitatively very significant increase. We could show this by staining for ISG15 uh, in the cells in the brains. So it certainly was a definite uh, um, observation. And interestingly, ISG15 is released in response to interferon as a tag. It identifies proteins in the cell which it doesn't recognize as cell as possible viruses and tags them for breakdown by the UPS. So it's part of the UPS system. So I don't know whether uh, a significant increase in interferon-related genes which are tagging viral proteins and targeting them forward towards the UPS uh, may uh, be part of the uh, pathophysiology of development of psychosis and methamphetamine, but it was just an interesting observation. And to, uh, as a method for that process, I often use this parked car that's being ta it's been tagged and is being led away because it's been illegally parked. So we had some progress in conclusion in uh, our understanding of the brain pathology in schizophrenia psychosis. We've not really made that much advance over the last 100 years. This is compared with the advances in Alzheimer's disease in the last 20 years. And um, there's numerous leads for possible subtle um, uh, changes in neuronal migration. Well, that is subtle, probably more affecting the interneurons than the pyramidal neurons. 
we have more uh, confidence in the fact there is a disruption of the cytoskeleton, especially the dendrites of the synapses, and that, that this, this may well be related to um, disruption of various signaling pathways that control uh, those dendrites and synapses, and that on top of that, there may well be an emerging disruption of the UPS function. And I think all these functions are interrelated. So I think my simple model so far, which is going to be far less simple than anything that Colin shows you, is that uh, psychosis may be related to disruption in intracellular signaling, overexpression of selenium binding protein and disruption of the ubiquitin protein system, and there are also, not yet talked about, possible involvement of transcription factors, which are causing damage anatomically to synapses, dendrites, and GABAergic neurons, and all these are resulting in this cough called psychosis. And there's a lot of people involved in this work, and I just want to thank a number of them. Thank you very much. <laughs>